Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Axon started out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. Imagine having 100 years of tire and wheel knowledge in your back pocket the next time you sell a piece of ag equipment. To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. This podcast is also brought to you by Valley Transportation. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransinc.com for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is also brought to you by AgDirect. No matter how you buy your ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Moving Iron. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. Marcus with Chip Nungler. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. If you're looking for a new pocket knife, Axon would like to give you one for free. If you'd like one, go to marketing at axontire.com and they'll send you a free Alliance branded tire, Alliance tire branded pocket knife. So you can take advantage of uh, the offer. Just go to marketing at axontire.com. Send them all your details. Tell them the Moving Iron Podcast sent you, and they'll drop it in the mail sent to you for free. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransinc.com for all your trucking needs at Valley Transportation. Our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy ag equipment, either whether it's from a dealer, an auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Chip Nellinger is with Blue Reef Agri Marketing from Morton, Illinois. <coughs> And Chip is nice enough to come on the podcast and talk about what's going on. Chip, how are you doing this morning? Hey, doing uh, doing well, Casey. Trying to figure out the market's quite a volatile uh, time frame we're in. Yeah, so uh, spend a little time talking about what's happening in the wheat market. Um, they've expanded limits to um, eighty-five cents. Talking about going up to dollar thirty if everything continues the way it's been going. Um, yesterday, interday volatility was quite impressive there was uh, a lot of swings one way or the other and uh finished up for the day but this in the overnight we it opened up uh like 47 and a half down and uh it's made its way back up a little bit to like 37 and some change so it's uh it's it's moving around but this volatility is uh, is just totally un unmasked i mean you just there's just i don't know how you keep your head above water right now yeah well um yeah unprecedented volatility in wheat and uh, fortunately um we're in the corn belt so the bulk of our business is corn and corn and beans right we do have some wheat producers and and it has been uh, a wild ride to say the least so um you know just unheard of issues from this war right from you know i mean i mean just things you could never even uh, imagine uh, affecting things and you know part of that volatility yesterday was uh midday probably around uh 12 ish noon central um so obviously we banned uh, the united states banned russian oil uh and then as kind of a counter to that putin came out and said well that's fine i'm gonna ban um you know all exports until uh the end of december to Europe and, and the United States. And so, I mean, it's kind of a moot point because I don't think anyone was going to buy the stuff anyway, but it, um, that's really, you know, pulled wheat all the way off a limit, um, you know, like a buck 30 lower and into higher territory. And so there's just massive amounts of volatility and it's not just wheat. It's, it's everything, you know, uh, the nickel markets traded the London mercantile exchange, you know, 150-year-old uh, commodity exchange. I believe it's one of the only uh, uh, exchanges that actually has human beings trading uh, in a, they call it a ring. Uh, a lot of people call it a pit. Uh, they had to actually suspend, until Monday, nickel trade. Right, I saw that the other day, yeah. 
so just you know crazy effects of, of this stuff that just is still flowing through that you know not everyone um you know even knows yet what the what the effects of this uh, russian invasion are going to be how long the black sea is going to be closed um you know from everything metals uh you know minerals uh fertilizer nitrogen uh grains obviously um you know now the question is going to become and i'd say there's some of this in the market already obviously but can they get a crop in the ground every day that goes by uh you know to me seems less and less likely even if they come to some you know agreement here and stop shooting mm-hmm. uh, it's so disrupted over there you know can they even you know they're from my understanding they're running out of food water fuel i mean they're just basically being choked off and even if it stop today uh, i don't know that they have enough time to resupply everything um you just, you just think about it um you know roads are blown up um you know fuel disrupted i saw on twitter the other day um a, a farmer from ukraine is like I, I i don't have enough fuel. i have some fuel i don't have enough for spring but i don't have my seed um right now and mm-hmm. so you know, uh, the friendly seed man probably not real hip on, uh, you know, delivering seed right now when there's a war going on. So just yeah. just untold amount of uncertainty and, and risk and volatility happen, happening in these in these markets. So yeah. uh, just changes by the minute. So, so I think the, the big question here with, with this stuff, obviously the war and everything else is there, but it's like you talked about, you know, if, if you stop tomorrow, what, what would that look like? And there, there's a lot of of things they have to do in the Black Sea just to get the black just to get the ports back open. I mean, they've mined all those ports and they've done all that stuff. Get those mines out, and make sure they've got them all, and, and kind of go through that that exercise. And then, as well as that, you have um, what damage that has been done to those ports. Um, and you know, one of the key objectives was to take uh, Odessa and Maripol, and then they've taken um, Kherson, which are right there. Those are all um, Black Sea. Uh, port cities right there along the along the way so i mean i guess as you if you talk to people and they said that i mean what kind of estimations do you see out there have you heard of any estimations when when it comes to just getting ships in and out of the black sea after this all settles down yeah i really haven't uh I, you know i don't think anyone knows i think that's part of the part of the problem we have here they so far it seems like uh odessa has been uh you know kind of kept out of it uh, from from my understanding so mm-hmm. far i think that's yeah. probably the next step if this thing continues uh but I, i've heard that several of the ports um are damaged so and you know when do workers come in uh if there's a ceasefire today you know when does the declaration of of, of war end right um i have read that uh, and i'm certainly not a specialist on this but uh read and and heard on on the news that um ship you know insurance companies won't cover a ship so all insurance all maritime insurance is null and void in any waters adjacent to uh you know an ongoing war and so you know oh, so that's, um, that's like that's <laughs> a lot that ends there's <laughs> not that alone uh, yeah. there's not going to be any shipping in or out of the black sea uh anytime soon unless it's um you know a ship that doesn't have insurance and that's a big risk so again that's part of what um the market's trying to figure out uh underlying all this it's been kind of quiet we got a crop report today um the market's still trying to figure out what the size of the south american crop is they've got some rain here recently some really good rains and uh, so i think their corn crop their second corn crop in brazil is off to a good start we need that now uh, obviously, the, the bigger the crop is there, the maybe more of a, of a cushion there is, but still very, very tight on, um, you know, world stocks now, especially not knowing how long the Black Sea is going to be affected for shipping uh, and whether they can get a crop in. And, you know, back to the, I didn't think about this till, uh, till yesterday, I was in a meeting and, you know, they have allegedly five to 600 million bushels of corn that's left to ship, mm-hmm. old crop corn. Uh, that would hit the export markets, but you know, think about this. Most of the electricity has been been cut off. It, it's kind of like early springtime. You know, it's been sloppy over there. Um, you know, a little rainy, a little snowy. 
you got so you got corn in bins with no electricity right now, and uh, you know that's never a good uh, a good issue. And so, how much of that five six hundred million bushels is going to go out of condition? How much can it even uh, you know be uh, uh, you know be shipped out when it uh, when they do uh, you know get uh, get back to normal? Uh, so it's it's just immeasurable uncertainty and, and risk right now. So let's talk about some crush rates. You know, you, you look at all the stuff that we got going on. I mean, supply and demand report comes out in March um, or comes out here today. And that's a big deal. But you start looking at like crush rates, ethanol crush, you start looking at uh, soybean crush for biodiesel, those kind of things. How, how is that playing into all this? Because now you're looking at, I mean, these guys with ethanol guys and, and biodiesel guys with $5 diesel and, you know, $4, you know, gasoline, there's some money to be made out there right now in the ethanol uh, sector. So I guess, I mean, how, how is that playing into what we see happening now? Yeah, we still have this, um, you know, world vegetable oil <clears throat> market issue. That was tight for the last year, 12, mm-hmm. 18 months at a minimum. And so uh, crush margins have been very strong. Uh, uh, you know, ethanol crush margins uh, are, are back again. Uh, there's, you know, here's one of the uncertainties. There's, you know, kind of a slow growing push to do away temporarily with the ethanol mandate. You know, it's like anything. Is it is it temporary? You know, a lot of times uh, temporary things become permanent very easily, especially out of Washington. So the fear uh, on that is that, you know, you get some major change on the you know renewable fuels standard <coughs> is that a possibility uh yeah sure <coughs> but right now um you know it's it's uh you know added some profitability to the bottom line and, and those margins are changing there's massive moves on cash basis levels here recently uh, as well with all the disruption and the and the you know big swings in the futures markets so you know, there's there's stress up and down the whole system right now, you know, from the cash grain side, from the, you know, hedgers that have had massive margin calls, uh, you know, end users that have had to scramble. And, you know, I thought I was going to get some black sea wheat, uh, corn, vegetable, you know, sunflower oil. Uh Oh, that's gone. But where do I get it now? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, panic almost. So, you know, the, the vegetable oil situation is not going to fix itself overnight. Uh, Malaysian palm oil is expected to be three, four uh, percent increase, but that's in this environment uh, helps. It's better than a three percent decrease, but it's still yeah. a very, very tight situation. Um, any way you cut it, from the vegetable oil markets uh, and, and now the wheat market, uh, and you know probably the corn market is a little bit scary, depending on the size of this uh, Brazil second crop corn. And with the back-to-back drought, there's a little, little bit of talk that they're so short, Brazil, because of their first crop corn, that they're going to maybe not export as much of that crop as what uh, is expected. And they've got a long way to go. They're just early on kind of finishing up planning here. But uh, that Brazilian second crop corn is going to be very important over the next 90 days, how that progresses in the, in the rainfall and the temperatures uh, they get on that crop. If there's any threat to that. I mean, it becomes scary bullish to corn then, uh, especially if the Black Sea is going to be, you know, months long closure. And it, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, it looks like that. Vision, yep. yeah, you can envision how that could happen very easily. Yep. All right. So, risk management perspective. I mean, just <laughs> no, no one could have planned for this. I mean, it's not like the Russia thing was is came out of nowhere. Uh, I think it was one of those things that people kind of ignored a little bit because it was a lot of saber rattling that never went anywhere and then one day it happened and kind of jumped up and got us but i mean right now i mean what's what's corn what's uh what's front month corn trading at right now let's see well we're down a little bit may corn is right now uh 746 and three quarters down six and a quarter new crop is 640 and a quarter down three and a quarter <coughs> uh, old crop you know if you have old crop at this stage um you know where you're at it's massive profitability it, it really not to be a jerk about it, but it really comes down to how long you want to gamble on uh, this crop. You know, right. you want to wait and see if we get any weather scares in June, July, uh, and, and take this corn to some stupid level. Uh, you know, eight and a half, nine dollars new all time highs. It's a possibility, especially if the Black Sea stays closed. Um, 
so your old crop, it's a little bit of a just roll the dice, right? Um, you wrote it this far, you got massive profitability. The new crop is a little bit different situation, right? It's still really good profits there. Mm -hmm. And I would say we're, what, a week out uh, or less from the crop insurance date here comes uh, uh, March 15th. And um, crop insurance is a huge part of this. And a lot of areas <coughs> at the highest level of crop insurance um, coverage, you're able to, you know, essentially insure break even or support pro profitability. <coughs> Excuse me. And so crop insurance plays into this new crop risk management in a huge way. <coughs> Man, I've been talking too much, Casey. And, and and then, you know, it becomes like if there's a problem, if there's a weather scare this year, you know, new crop corn could go to new all-time highs. So you've got that balancing act of, hey, we're profitable right now. Uh, what do I do? How do I do that? You you, you don't want to say, well, I got 150 bucks an acre profit. Let's take it. And then in June, we have a weather problem, and you're like, oh, now it's $400 an acre profit because I got it all locked in. To me, that's where some option strategies come in, whether that's you know covering some sales with calls so you have upside, or instead of making sales, you use uh, some puts. And so the, the higher we get above the spring price, which was 590 in December corn, 1433 in November beans, that was your spring crop insurance guarantee uh, spring price, the higher you get above there, the more it makes sense to do something to start locking in your profitability. But I think what the wheat market has just showed us is, um, in my mind, that's probably, locking that in is probably more of an option play because nothing beats the cash grain. You, if we do a moonshot, you want the cash grain uh, in your pot. I'm not saying don't sell any. I'm just saying don't get too far ahead of your skis on corn and beans here um, and say, yeah, that's great, wildly profitable. And then in July, say, man, I left $3 a bushel on the table because that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, prospective acre reports going to be coming out here pretty quick, right? And that's kind of watch, watch the right hand and don't pay attention to the left hand type of report. But when you're, when you're looking at that, I mean, what, what's your thoughts right now? I mean, you've got... Uh, you got oh, corn God. and you got corn. You got you got all these people that are talking about corn acres and soybean acres and this, that, and the other thing. And and the price of corn is high enough now that the scare of input costs have, has kind of subsided a little bit. Um, obviously, soybeans are going to be very profitable, assuming that you know you got some, you locked in some some futures there. But I mean, what's your thoughts yeah, there? I uh, my thoughts first of all, are I hate that report. I think it's the wrong timing. The, the information's already been collected. The surveys are done. And to your point, Casey, the last week, 10 days, you've had, you know, corn probably make up some, some ground on, on beans in here. <clears throat> um, I just don't see how we don't pick up bean acres. Uh, there's, but there's a wider variance of opinions on this acreage report than I've ever seen, meaning we're going to have some shock uh, on March 31st. And unfortunately the numbers probably aren't even going to be accurate and, and, but the market's going to trade on it. Then we're going to get an update in June and you don't get your final one till, um, the January crop report when you really, really know. Mm -hmm. So I hate the March 31st report. Uh, I think we opened the door up for a massive amount of volatility surrounding that. Um, you know, there's literally from 88 million acres of corn to 94 million acres of corn, are the estimates uh, from from low to high, and and so that matters that big of a of a discrepancy, <clears throat> and plus you got all these other crops. You know, cotton's really high, spring wheat, um, uh, you know, canola up north, uh, peas and vegetable crops, uh, peanuts in the south, rice. Uh, it's a it's a shot in the dark. So. Right. Um, Everything's worth planning right now, right? Yeah, plus on that day, you get a quarterly stock report, too. Right. And so, yeah, I, I don't know what... I hate that day. Uh, I hate that acreage report with a passion. But, you know, the market's going to trade the numbers, even if they're not accurate. And yep. so, uh, I'm in the camp, which is probably scary because I am a bad uh, predictor of this acreage report. I would think that uh, we're down on corn acreage and and up on bean acreage, but 
there's certainly people that uh, feel the, the opposite of that too. Okay. All right. Last thing, just because of its correlation, um, two things. Price of oil has gone through the roof, right? I mean, we're trading Brent oil at 130 some dollars a barrel, and you got all that stuff hammering away right now. Um, let's see, Brent crude, where are you at? Crude's, crude's been all over. Uh, it's about 117.55 right now. It's okay. down about 620. But now nine off its highs. There's a little bit of news here that potentially Ukraine may be ready to negotiate here. I think that's part of why these markets are uh, like all these markets have been rallying, like the gold market, the dollar, crude, uh, wheat, obviously, uh, are taking a little bit of breather here. I don't know what negotiate means. You know, nobody knows right. what, what that means or what either side will uh, eventually uh, agree to, if anything. Right. Uh, so when you're looking at the, the cattle market and how this all plays together, so cattle herd's been down a little bit, but the, and it's kind of been keeping the price up. Really, you've seen some fluctuation, some volatility in, in cash cattle, but there's not been this huge fall-off that you would expect with the price of corn the way it is and then accompany that with the price of oil the way it is. And may, it might just be all of a sudden too early type of thing that they're, they're still trying to let the dust settle and see where things go. But I, I'm not, I guess I'm not seeing the reaction that I, that I thought I would see in that market. So I go, what are your thoughts there? Uh, I agree with you. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, the ca I think we're still dealing with some large numbers, right? And uh, and the cash markets have fallen back a little bit, and, and the packer margins have, have shrank just a little bit because box beef fell off. But I, I think you're probably at some good levels here. I think the feeder cattle market was trying to, uh, <clears throat> you know, get uh, – it's head around, you know, seven and a half dollar corn, which pushed cash corn in the plains well over eight bucks. And and so um, I think we're probably close to some decent support in here uh, in the cattle. But what we've got to <clears throat> watch, and, and I remember you and I talking about this even before this uh, Ukraine deal, uh, is you know, inflation clamping down on the consumer and then pulling back, right? Mm -hmm. I just filled my car up two days ago. I think it's like 30 cents more than uh, now than when I filled it up. Uh, it's like $109, right? Yeah. So you can only do that for so long. And, you know, I know a few weeks ago I went and uh, got a filet and it was like 32 bucks a pound. And uh, so that's what we got to watch. <clears throat> on the beef side of the equation uh, right. is, you know, economy slowing down, inflation kind of crimping everybody, and, uh, you know, beef demand going down. So, uh, you know, I, again, our exports are part of that, and they've been strong. But that's, in the long run, that's a little bit of a, of a concern. As it is with all commodities, right, corn, beans, wheat, the backside of this inflation thing uh, is going to be ugly. Mm hmm I don't know. I mean, there's no one that can predict it. If they if they're telling you they can predict it, uh, you better run away from them. Right. And that doesn't mean you're not going to go right. to nine, ten dollar corn first. But eventually, economics wins, right? And mm -hmm. they say the cure for low prices, low prices. The opposite's true as well. <clears throat> Especially if you're into a situation where the Fed's increasing rates to get a control of inflation, the world economy shrinks, uh, the consumers, you know, crushed by energy and food prices and rent uh and demand goes down at the same time high prices bring in a bunch of production across the world we have back-to-back -back record crops in north america and south america all of a sudden we're swimming in grain again and uh, that will happen it might be 18 months from now it might be 24 months from now uh, but that will happen and that's what we have to really guard against um in my opinion so that's a long answer that it's kind of related to the your, your beef and cattle question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's immediate, but uh, boy, we gotta we gotta watch that closely and try to stay on the front edge of that curve because we will go over the cliff eventually, <clears throat> and um, we're gonna have to be much more aggressive with uh, protecting ourselves when that happens. But uh, right now, I think things are at a pretty good support level. Not that they can't go a little bit lower in, in hogs or cattle, 
but I think you're um, you're at pretty good levels here that uh, should be some long term support. All right, good stuff, man. Well, Chip, uh, appreciate you being on the podcast, man. You bet. It's always interesting, Casey. It's getting uh, more and more confusing out there daily. So that's right. It's good to stay on top of it. What's the best way to get a hold of you at Blue Your Factor Marketing? Yeah, best way is just call our office, 309-550-7213. Right on. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I also go to LinkedIn as well. I post stuff there. Uh, that's where you find the latest editions of the Moving Iron Podcast and blogs as well. Go to movingironllc.com with the entire library of the Moving Iron Podcast as well as every blog I've ever written is there, uh, posted up there on the blog section. For more information about the Moving Iron Summit coming up in Nashville, Tennessee, that's September 6th, 7th, and 8th at the Hilton downtown. Uh, go to Moving Iron LLC and you can check it out out there as well. So uh, speaker information, how to get in, uh, register for the event. There's also hotel information, all that kind of stuff right there as well. So with that, I am Casey Seymour with Chip Nellinger. Let's move smart, folks. Out. Axon Tire is going to have more tips, tricks, and client advice throughout the year and in September at the Moving Iron Summit in Nashville. If you're looking to sign up for the event, please head over to movingironllc.com. We hope to see you there. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransitinc.com for all of your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Moving